Dr. Donald Hanna, Chief Economist of CIMB. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. I'm very honored to be here today to speak about ASEAN Vision 2040, and I'd like to thank Chari for organizing and hosting this event. My job is to introduce this work to you and then let the ex experts take it from there. Having said that, introducing this work is a lot easier said than done. This is a four volume compilation of thoughtfully written chapters by 60 ASEAN experts. Let me see if I can. I've done something wrong. Each chapter is a fascinating exploration of crucial issues confronting the region now and in the near future. The product is the result of these experts working since early 2018 to produce a cohesive vision made up of disparate parts. What is the value of such an endeavor? Why bring together all these busy people from across the region to discuss, debate, imagine a future for ASEAN? We, IRIA, and everyone who supported this process, including especially the government of the Kingdom of Thailand, strongly believe that a work towards such a vision is one of the greatest aspirations we can have. Dr. Ponciano Intal, the director of this project, is very sorry not to be here this morning with us. Throughout the whole process, of developing this work, Dr. Intel's mantra was a leave no one behind, meaning we're striving for an inclusive ASEAN. B, make the ASEAN project vital to the lives and livelihoods of its people. And C, the future of ASEAN may be greatly diminished if it fails to deliver. The topics covered in these volumes range from trade to technology, from infrastructure to identity, from energy to e-commerce. Thus, what we have in Vision ASEAN 2040 could actually be presented as a multitude of complementary visions. And the work goes beyond vision and lays out specific strategies and recommendations. As an indication of how quickly things change, one of ASEAN Vision 2040's key points was the need to embrace an ASEAN position on the Indo-Pacific. This has already happened with the adoption of the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific at the 34th ASEAN Summit just a few weeks ago. The recent discourse on Indo-Pacific has the potential of creating a wedge amongst countries in the wider region. The ASEAN outlook achieves Vision 2040's emphasis on reframing the Indo-Pacific concept towards inclusion, cooperation, and connectivity within the ASEAN-centered regional architecture. At present, we are in a period of tremendous geopolitical uncertainty arising from the realignment of interests from outside of the region. Simultaneously, we face the challenges of a rapidly emerging new industrial revolution. More than ever, the ASEAN enterprise is being tested. Looking forward, the world the ASEAN will have to deal with over the next two decades will be vastly different from that in which it has evolved over the past five decades. By 2040, ASEAN, China, and India will belong to the top four economies in the world, putting Asia at the center of the global economy. That will make it imperative for the region to secure an open trading system and plural global order, which has been at the heart of Asia's and ASEAN's success. The next two decades will see the acceleration in the region and the world of the digital transformation and the fourth industrial revolution. These technological changes present huge opportunities, but also risks that ASEAN will have to manage. ASEAN Vision 2040 seeks to assess these challenges and many more and sets out a vision to achieve a prosperous and inclusive ASEAN. In a nutshell, ASEAN Vision 2040 is a vision of an ASEAN that steps boldly forward towards the year 2040 to transform the ASEAN community and secure its position in the region and globally. 
This requires a proactive approach with a common diplomatic posture underpinned by the principle of collective leadership. ASEAN in 2040 can be adaptive and innovative, embracing the digital transformation and fourth industrial revolution. It can be resilient and sustainable, adopting new technologies and best practices, integrated and connected, supported by good regulatory practice and inclusive and inclusive, focused on people empowerment and a sense of ASEAN identity. All of this must be supportive, supported by an effective ASEAN institutional ecosystem. ASEAN Vision 2040 lays out key priorities for consideration by ASEAN stakeholders. I'll highlight a few that are most relevant to today's discussion on the imperative of collective leadership, ASEAN integration, and ASEAN centrality. Most of these papers on these themes can be found in volume two. First priority, collective leadership. The multilateral economic regime is under threat, and with it, Asia's economic and political security. The weight that Asia now has in the multilateral system suggests that leadership must come from this region. No single country can lead in Asia, which has several large powers and divergent interests. Asian collective leadership is now critical to global economic policy outcomes at the core of ASEAN interests. If protectionism continues to rise outside Asia, there will be pressure for Asia to follow the protectionist path. Individual countries will not be able to withstand that pressure, but collectively Asia can. Three principles of collective leadership need to guide the region. One, a shared commitment to multilateral principles and processes. This principle of cooperation has allowed the region to develop and prosper while managing interstate relationships. Two, consensus decision-making based on equality and shared partnership. Forging consensus takes time and requires compromise and trust. Three, regional cooperation to build on international rules and norms. A commitment to all these principles as the foundations for regional affairs will ensure against hegemonic leadership, produce regional and global public goods and deepen economic integration. Second priority, ASEAN integration and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP. Achieving a prosperous ASEAN community relies on relationships with major economies outside of ASEAN, not just integration between ASEAN states. Integration into the regional economy will also strengthen ASEAN's in, uh, regional influence, international agenda, and global voice. The RCEP is critical to deepen that process Better coordination between existing economic and political cooperation will help navigate challenges to regional prosperity. The RCEP is now the only active, credible, multilateral endeavor anywhere in the world positioned to deliver significant pushback on the retreat from globalization. Yet RCEP is not simply another free trade agreement. It incorporates an important cooperation agenda to build capacity for economic reform and regional development. Its cooperation has also had significant political, will have significant political and security payoff that will assist in ameliorating regional tensions and managing relations with bigger powers. Importantly, the RCEP will need to be an ongoing process with economic cooperation and collective leadership at its core. Now, as I was putting this presentation together, I found online this uh, image that you see at the bottom of the screen. That's actually Iria's logo that someone adopted for other purposes. <laughs> so I thought I would uh, repatriate it back to Iria and use it for today's presentation. Third priority, ASEAN centrality. ASEAN provides the platform for regional cooperation and a buffer to manage great power relations, which are more easily handled in a broader framework than if pursued bilaterally. Thank you. Continuing economic integration underpins, underpins ASEAN centrality in Asian affairs. The drive to realize a single market and production base, 
can safeguard ASEAN's continued centrality in efforts for greater integration and connectivity in the, great, in the wider region. ASEAN's central role in peace building would be enhanced with the implementation of the Code of Conduct on the South China Sea and with the multilateralization of the Treaty of Amnity and Cooperation, not only between ASEAN and non-ASEAN countries, but also amongst non-ASEAN countries. ASEAN can partner with middle powers like Australia and the Republic of Korea, who face similar challenges in respect to the rise of major powers, to address these challenges in a manner that helps manage their relations. In conclusion, reforming and strengthening ASEAN institutions and coordination around these three strategic priorities <coughs> will ensure member states can better manage the rapid changes underway. Success requires building coherent ASEAN strategies and engaging regional and global partners in collective leadership to address each issue. Internally addressing these issues will require enhanced policy capacity and coordination and steady institutional change. More than ever, for ASEAN to strengthen centrality and community, it will need, need greater creativity, connectivity, and complementarity. More than ever, this will require strong political will to keep and grow the ASEAN community and make it work better for the benefit of ASEAN peoples. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lydia. The, the next speaker is also from area. You know, Professor Kimura. We we call him uh, Fuku. Please, uh, he'll make a short presentation to augment uh, the one made by 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 Lydia just now. Please, Professor. My excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for coming for this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, I would like to thank uh, CIMB to uh, organize uh, this uh, event. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, um, I'd like to talk about uh, the aspect of uh, new technology, uh, particularly. This is a part of uh, the ASEAN 2040 report. Uh, but, uh, as you know, that we have now uh, two big challenges. One is uh, globalization, another is uh, technology. So, uh, so in the setting of uh, globalization, how to uh, utilize uh, technology and avoiding various kinds of backlash, uh, that's a sort of challenge for us. Uh, then. Uh, we have a big discussion, uh, particularly in advanced economies, that uh, uh, humans may be substituted by machines. And they're uh, really worrying about a sort of disruptive technology. And can technology be uh, disruptive for newly developed and developing economies? We really have to think of that a little bit more carefully here. Uh, basically, the message is that we really have to utilize technology if a good technology is there. Uh, and we cannot really expect uh, foresee, foresee all sorts of backlash uh, beforehand, actually. But, uh, but it's really uh, important to have a sort of really positive attitude toward utilizing those kind of technology. That's, a, that's a ba basically a sort of a message that we like to make it. Um, so uh, the starting point is that we have globalization, particularly in the case of Malaysia. Uh, we are uh, utilizing global value chains very actively. And then how we can capture a large portion of value added uh, with a good dynamic impacts uh, in, in, in the global value chains. That's, uh, that's basics that we really have to do that. Uh, some are really sticking to uh, the domestic value added ratio sometimes, uh, but actually ratio is not quite important. Uh, the, va the magnitude of value, value value added, that itself is much more important actually. So and actually Malaysia uh, has been da done that a lot, uh, utilizing global value chains very actively. Uh, then the proportion of value added out of total value added will be small, but the total transactions are a lot. Uh, so that means that a lot of value added is here. And then uh, in terms of uh, international division of labor, 
Uh, we utilize so-called second unbundling for uh, production networks in the manufacturing sector, particularly in the machinery industry, so particularly here in uh, electronics. Um, if we look at ASEAN as a whole, uh, still there is a uh, ample room for utilizing this uh, mechanism a lot. Uh, probably pretty much saturated in the case of Malaysia and Thailand so far, but still we have a lot of production blocks uh, in these countries. We like to keep uh, the value at uh, value chains over there. How we can keep those value chains in the mid midst of a technological revolution? This is one challenge that we have to do. And then uh, it's a new type of uh, international division of labor may come pretty soon. Uh, that is, say, say cross-border service, service outsourcing. Uh, now, uh, the division of labor could be coming down to the individual level, uh, not even uh, the production blocks, but the uh, individual level to do uh, one task across uh, borders. So that is sometimes called the third unbundling. Uh, then we have to be ready for utilizing those kind of new type of uh, division of labor pretty soon. So that's a setting that before we talk about uh, so that technology. Uh, so, so this is a, just an a illustration a la uh, Richard Baldwin. Uh, his, uh, in, in his book uh, published in uh, 2016. So in, in the first unbundling, that was an old type of division of labor, industry by industry division of labor. But we did that a lot up to 1980s. And then up, up to the, from the 1990s, uh, we had so-called the second unbundling, now unbundle the tasks. So uh, many tasks are cons making uh, one job, one, one work actually, but uh, production process-wise division of labor is coming, and that was second unbundling. We are uh, utilizing that a lot. That's a, that's a uh, very much a sort of characteristics of uh, ASEAN and East Asia right, right now. And we were good at utilizing that so far. And then the third unbundling, we would have a much more sophisticated individual level division of labor in the future. So, uh, so how we would think of uh, new technologies? Uh, so key message is that we have to engage in new technologies very actively and do, do not be afraid of uh, positive backlash too much. And, and also, it's really nice to think of uh, technologies into two aspects, uh, same technology group, but uh, uh, the way of utilizing is different. One side is uh, information technology, the other side is uh, communication technology. Actually, the impact on those two types of, uh, two phases of technologies are quite different. So uh, in, when we face, in, face the new technologies, uh, actually the context of uh, those technologies would be quite different uh, between developed economies and uh, say ASEAN member states, for example. So in developed economies, uh, uh, say technology is often perceived as disruptive, uh, quite different from the, the past, and also some part of jobs are disrupted and others, that kind of aspect, aspect will be really very much uh, emphasized. Uh, why is that? Actually, so if you look at the macro level, new technologies are actually generating a lot of jobs in their countries too. But in a sort of social as, uh, impact, uh, it would be sometimes pretty negative. Uh, if you think of the reason, uh, say, why, why is that? It's actually they are basically a mature economy, and uh, growth rate is uh, usually very slow. And also, uh, it depends on the country, but uh, uh, population, people are old, and uh, sometimes a shrinking population like Japan. Uh, and then, then actually the substitutability between machines and labor uh, is really emphasized. Uh, that's because a sort of adjustment is getting slower for them. Uh, so uh, industrial adjustment is with friction in many cases. So people like to stick to the current job. Uh, they don't want to switch. 
actually. So, so that kind of dynamism is uh, lost. Uh, then actually the adjustment is sometimes very uh, painful. And then that, that painful portion had a lot of at attraction actually so in, in their context. So, uh, and, and also they must compete at the frontier of, of developing new technologies. That's also very costly too. So, so in, the, in the context of uh, ASEAN member states, uh, if you see, flip, flip the coins, uh, say the technologies should be embraced as engines of economic development and uh, economies are ready to be transformed anytime. And we have uh, rapid economic growth. Uh, it depends on the country, actually, but the pretty f still a pretty fast uh, economic growth. And uh, mostly uh, young, vigorous population. Uh, young population is very important in order to utilize new technologies, actually. It depends on the country, again, too. But it's, uh, Malaysia is pretty young, yes. Um, then, uh, then we can think of a complementarity between machines and labor much more positively. Uh, then we have dynamic economies, so new jobs are created, uh, people are willing to change, switch, a bit, switch to better jobs. So that is a quite different attitude from uh, to people in develop, develop, developed countries. And we can avoid redundant R&D, and then we can concentrate on uh, imitative innovation and also application of uh, the technologies. So, so if we're going to add the two phases of digital revolution for ASEAN member states, uh, IT portion, so IT uh, is, uh, for example, in AI, robotics, uh, big data, uh, then actually uh, that basically uh, making uh, data processing faster, and then reduce the number of tasks. So if you j just look at at the macro level, uh, the number of tasks is reducing. That means that uh, we, have, we may have narrower room for division of labor. Uh, then we have to think of uh, whether or not we can get some piece of uh, division of labor in, in, these, in our countries. Um, so, so actually, uh, we really need uh, the innovation hubs in order to catch uh, new information on new technology. Uh, we may not generate uh, real new technologies, but we really have to be knowledgeable uh, for those kind of uh, technologies. And also, uh, we have to utilize complementarity of uh, machines and human. And we, we've already have a, a manufacturing sector here. Uh, then uh, some people are worrying about so-called reshoring. Uh, those kind of production blocks may go back to developed countries uh, because uh, in developed countries now robotics and also AI are available. So, so possibly uh, our strength of, uh, on uh, labor uh, would be diminished possibly. So, so that's a one, one, one possibility. Uh, but actually, the introduction cost of a machine, uh, robotics or AI could be pretty low, actually. That may not be very, very expensive. And the industry as a whole is uh, getting more AI intensive, uh, robotics intensive. So, so I think uh, the introduction of robotics and AI in our countries may may enhance the possibilities of keeping production blocks in our countries. So, so I think uh, uh, not just uh, talking about a really simplistic uh, substitutability between labor and mach machines, but uh, we have to seek some complementarity. So, uh, so possibly uh, in order to keep production blocks in global value chains, uh, we may need some mild promotion of uh, the introduction of uh, robotics over there too. Uh, actually, uh, I am uh, conducting some one uh, empirical study recently and still preliminary, but uh, trying to pick up the relationship between the introduction of robotics and 
uh, uh, network trade, uh, say uh, t trade in machinery uh, parts and components of finished products. Actually, uh, we, we find uh, it's a positive relationship between those two. Uh, particularly in East Asia, actually not not quite in other parts of the world. So in order to keep uh, production blocks and expand the network trade, uh, the introduction of robotics may work to some extent. The other side, uh, uh, communication technology, uh, say I'm talking about the internet, uh, smartphones, 5G, uh, those are sorry, co communication technology. Actually, those are coming already. Uh, you all have uh, smartphones, and that changed, uh, changed your life uh, very drastically. Uh, that's quite different three years ago, five years ago. Uh, that happens for almost everybody in, in here. So, so actually, that, that kind of technology overcomes distance. Uh, that, that encourage uh, domestic and cross-border division of labor. So that may, uh, if we have a better uh, city, then we may have more chances to attract some economic activities here. So uh, actually, uh, we observed a lowering of uh, much matching cost uh, matching cost in not 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 in B to B but B to C or C to C uh, that makes uh, various kinds of uh, new uh, businesses. So uh, you can see that starting from social media, uh, transport, tourism, in matching, uh, e-commerce. Um, fintech, uh, e-payments, uh, those are really supported by city. So, so we still need uh, some policies. Actually, policies are really behind uh, the, 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 the introduction of city. City introduction is done pretty much by uh, market mechanism, actually. Uh, but, but we need uh, at least a sort of good de uh, digital connectivity to avoid the digital device. Uh, then actually uh, the physical infrastructure is going behind compared with uh, digital, digital connectivity. So we really have to utilize that for so inclusiveness for many people. And, and that at the same time, data flows are extremely important here. Uh, so when we talk about uh, various kinds of policies on data flows or data-related businesses, sometimes we really think of a sort of industrial policy type mind, and that is important too. But uh, ultimately, what is important is a people's life. Uh, say users uh, benefit, and also consumers benefit. So, so data, data flows with uh, uh, comfort, uh, that is extremely important for people. So that's a, that should be a sort of central in policy making. So uh, one thing to uh, organize uh, uh, data related policies, I think uh, the start, start up from the free flow of data at the center, that generates a lot of benefits for people. I think that way of thinking will be very important. Uh, then, uh, of course, we have uh, various kinds of economic issues and also social concerns uh, once data are moving around. Uh, so then we really have to reorganize policies related to the data flows. Uh, this is uh, uh, just a one uh, coming from a, a policy brief in the last uh, T20, support, supporting uh, G20 this year, actually. Uh, so uh, the data-related policies are so fragmented across countries right now. Uh, but uh, th those uh, we, th well planning and also implementing those policies uh, is extremely important. This is a very important element that we have to utilize city. So, and then uh, the, utilizing uh, those kind of technologies, uh, the, we, can, we have a very deep implication for the, uh, inclusive growth. Uh, on the IT portion, uh, on average, uh, middle range human capital seems to be affected first uh, if we uh, look at the various kinds of empirical studies in the developed countries, uh, rather than uh, low or high human capital, actually. So, so that's uh, one thing that we have to expect. 
uh, say, so it's a really simplistic bank clerks and others will be substituted by machines relatively easily. Uh, but the higher, higher portion and lower portion of human capital may be complementary. Uh, but we need to make human capital complement to IT. Uh, this, this is the implication. And the other is a communication technology. Uh, platform users can be anybody. I think this is very important. Uh, pr uh, it, it, even not college graduates can be uh, can be platform users actually. So the, that 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 generates room for participation by S SM MSMEs uh, or individuals uh, to the market. And then, of course, uh, for platform, giant platformers, uh, we have, uh, say, competition policy issue, taxation, and others. Uh, but uh, the other side of coin, uh, say, the utilization of the data generates a lot of benefits to usual people. So that, that has a very important element of uh, inclusiveness in the future. So, so the key message is that IT and CT, those who generate, generate different impacts on our, our society and the economy, uh, but we should not be afraid of uh, utilizing new technologies. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Foucault. Uh, our next speaker uh, has had an illustrious career uh, I've known her for a long time, but more importantly, uh, she's an old uh, ASEAN hand, and uh, her knowledge uh, of trade, not just within ASEAN, but even beyond, uh, is second to none. So we are uh, privileged uh, this morning to have Marie Pangas to speak. Please, Marie. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I think you said that I was an old ASEAN hand. It doesn't make me old, though. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Just senior. <laughs> but I have spent most of my professional and public policy life dealing with trade, ASEAN, uh, and regionalism, and, and multilateralism. So today I'm going to take a somewhat, um, uh, perhaps, a big picture view uh, of what we're going to be talking about uh, today and, and uh, responding to the report or following up on the report. I think uh, I just the, the main conclusion that I want you to go away with today from uh, my brief presentation is that we are facing uh, very, very turbulent uh, winds. We have a, a very challenging uh, external situation which, for want of a better word, it's, is the new normal, which, is, which, which doesn't feel very normal, by the way. It feels very abnormal. Uh, and, but we need to understand that to know the context of where, why ASEAN centrality is so important and why we must strengthen uh, the, co the integration and the cooperation within ASEAN uh, so that uh, we as ASEAN uh, need to stand together to be able to withstand the turbulence that we are facing. Uh, and, uh, and this is a very important message because I think uh, there have been lots of discussion about uh, is ASEAN still relevant? Uh, can ASEAN, you know, is ASEAN centrality still there or has it really uh, not been very important in, in, the, in the recent past and so on? So I think um, if anything, the, the turbulence we're facing, the challenge to multilateralism, uh, the challenge to, to trade uh, and all the global value chains and the regional value chains that have made uh, this region uh, grow and develop uh, uh, is really the challenge of why ASEAN has become so much more important. So that, that's really what I'm going to try to explain. So just to remind you the context a little bit, it, it is all of this is in the report, by the way. So I'm not sure which, which volume, probably volume one. <laughs> Uh, you know, we are we are ASEAN, but we are at different levels of development, and we have different demographies. Thailand is aging. Indonesia has a demographic bonus, uh, and we are all of us ha have the challenge of where do we go next in our stage of development. You have the least developed countries like Myanmar, who are still trying to figure out well, which way do I go. But there's an interesting story about Myanmar leapfrogging using digital uh, technology, for instance. A country like Indonesia. Indonesia or perhaps uh, Malaysia, we're in the middle level of development where we are 
struggling with what next after export oriented industrialization maturation of gvcs which are severely being disrupted by the trade wars uh, and the challenge of the digital economy you know where do we go uh, and the more developed countries like singapore uh, i guess malaysia falls more on in here how do we get out of the middle income trap so we have all have different challenges but uh, we are facing this at a time of great disruption and uncertainty uh, most foremost being the trade tension, the geopolitical hotspots, the technological disruption and competition, and the challenge of climate change. Let's not uh, underestimate uh, the uh, challenge of sustainable development and climate change. But today, I'm just going to focus on on the trade uh, tensions because if you if you can't uh, have, you know, you can't go back. You, it's not business as usual. In the past, we would have said, okay, continue openness, continue our reforms. Uh, things will. You know, we'll graduate uh, through the global value chain. Uh, it's not that kind of world anymore. Uh, something is broken. Uh, since 2016, we've had major disruption uh, with Brexit, with the election of President Trump in November 2016. Increased protectionism and nationalist policies, which are uh, linked to various causes, including inequality, globalization, uh, WTO, notions of unfair competition with China. And, you know, in the background, we have to, we cannot ignore the fact that a lot of this has happened because it's no longer uh, one major power, hege hegemonic power, the US. The emergence of China in the last uh, two decades have really, uh, I think, uh, disrupted many things. Um, and U.S., the most important thing, which was mentioned uh, by Lydia, the U.S. is no longer the defender of the global economic order. I think that's really, really uh, the most disrupting thing that's uh, broken. Uh, they left TPP immediately upon Trump uh, becoming president. And, you know, you see the tariff war, and you see the tit for tat, you see the retaliation. But it's not really about the trade war, right? We all know there's more to it uh, than that. Uh, it's just, it's about economic competition, it's about technology competition. Uh, and, you know, we thought we had um, overcome this issue of tariffs as an instrument for protection, but guess what? It's coming back as a vengeance. But it's used not for protection, but tariff as a tool for many, many things, including non-economic objectives. And I think the, uh, the, the, on the positive side, uh, we, we have seen the rise of Japan uh, in increasingly in taking a leadership position uh, to to address the vacuum that was left by uh, the US and something that China has not really stepped up uh, to the to the platform yet but you can see Japan uh, quickly uh, took over the the lead to uh, have TPP 11 uh, and played a key role in um, uh, making sure CPTPP uh, was completed despite the US exit and and continuing to support RCEP and most importantly, warming up with China, right? So in this kind of world, uh, you remember there was a like seven year period of very, very cold relationship between China and Japan. But uh, one of the things, I think Abe has, Prime Minister Abe uh, is emerging now as one of the more agile leaders in uh, navigating this broken system. Uh, basically, you have to find allies and balance everything. And their key role as chair of the G20, which has just passed, where they did really uh, work work hard, uh, not, not to our total satisfaction, to make sure that uh, multilateralism, but, but WTO reforms, uh, digital governance and so on, uh, is uh, one of the commitments of the G G20 countries. Um, and uh, this is the reality. The trade tensions are not likely to be resolved soon. Maybe it's going to take a long time. Uh, U.S. China, uh, do you, you know the the negotiations broke down, uh, and whatever they're gonna, they've now have a peace. Uh, what is it called? Um, a ceasefire truce. They have a temporary truce, and they probably you know try to come up with something, uh, but it's not going to be the answer. It's going to only be something that will just try to to uh, delay. Uh, a, uh, the big explosion. Uh, you have to think that President Trump is facing elections in 2020 and all my American friends, uh, Don can um, uh, chip in later, uh, say that 
this is bipartisan. If we, if pre Trump gets it, whether or not Trump gets elected, the issue of anti-China and trade tensions is still going to be in the American uh, policy, and it is about the emergence of China. You know, China's economy grew six times between 2001 and 2017, and its trade increased ten times uh, between 1992 and 2017. We haven't even touched on on the sort of the technology. Uh, uh, the developments they have achieved in technology. In China itself, uh, the, the recent break up, uh, breakdown uh, in negotiations has actually hardened the nationalists versus the reformists. You could say that the reformers were actually quite happy with the pressure from Trump because it was pushing the reform agenda of China. But now uh, the, the seemingly very interventionist approach of of bullying approach or, or interventionist approach uh, of, of the US has hardened the nationalist position. So for China itself, it's not going to be also easy, uh, despite the desire, and if you read President Xi's speeches uh, in Davos, in, in the Belt and Road Forum, he's talking about reform, but you know whether this can really be happening is, I think, a big challenge. And so it is here for the long term and complex, and this is the context why ASEAN centrality is so important. You know, what is unfair trade? Trade deficit in goods and currency manipulation has also now emerged as another um, uh, 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 another instrument uh, of unfairness. And how much your currency is being is being manipulated is equivalent to an export subsidy, according to the U.S. And that's why they justify using tariffs. National security. We know that they've used steel, uh, national security argument uh, in the steel case uh, and in the use of technology. Uh, and it's very, very complex. It's not just an economic and trade issue. It's a business competition issue. It's a technology issue. And it's a security issue in a multipolar world. So there you have it. That, that's really in, encapsulating how complex the issue is. And ASEAN needs to hold its ground within that um, uh, very complex uh, situation. And the, we know the issues are not about trade in goods. We know it has to do with uh, IPR, uh, transparency, market distorting policies, role of SOEs, industrial subsidies, technology transfer, technology competition, uh, the Huawei issue. And unfortunately, I'm very uh, quite depressed with the most recent development of the Japan-Korea uh, uh, tr trade war, uh, which is really using, again, national security arguments to impose tariffs or at least to control imports for non-economic uh, reasons. So this, there you have it. Trade tensions is creating great uncertainty. Uh, and and I think um, this is really the, 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 the challenge for us, and it's here for the long term. And great uncertainty uh, is affecting the growth and trade outlook of the world economy, and therefore ASEAN, uh, because we, most of us are open economies. And you know, there's a lot of talk about the trade war creating opportunities and challenges for ASEAN countries, but you know, th th to me, those are just short-term uh, kind of issues. We really need to focus on the long term uh, of, of what is the world going to look like for ASEAN and how should ASEAN play a role in shaping the world that we will face. So uh, interestingly enough, uh, this is from the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council survey of businesses, the most recent one, the possible slowdown in world trade growth and a slowdown in the Chinese economy, which I would have thought hits businesses more, is actually less compared to the increased protectionism and trade wars. Because what's happening is what, what Fuku described, uh, the global value chain, the regional value chain, this is being severely disrupted. And investors are really having scratching their head because they don't know where the uncertainty is causing them. Uh, they want to relocate, which is uh, the, the first uh, reaction is my main concern is the increased pr uh, pr uncertainty over trade policy. What do I need to do? What, uh, what is my response? I'm going to invest or increase operations in one or more countries. Diversify uh, sourcing, diversify location. But I can't figure out which country is going to be next on the U.S. list, right? So very uncertain. So what are you going to do? I think you're just going to have to 
widely spread it. And, and here is where, again, ASEAN uh, needs to play a role. Uh, and if you look at, okay, uh, we have these conversations in, um, in Indonesia all the time. How, how can we benefit uh, from, the, um, from this trade war, right? And this is just a, a number that shows you the export similarity between uh, all the Asian countries, including ASEAN, uh, with what China is exporting to the US. And uh, Mal Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, and Vietnam will be the most potential uh, alternative exporters from ASEAN to replace goods from China in the US market because of it, the similarity of its export. Indonesia, less so. But there's always uh, 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 dark clouds in the silver lining. Uh, but because you are linked, these countries are also linked to China, uh, China through the global value chains. So if China slows down, you're also going to be slowing down. And Malaysia is the number one. The, the white is the industrial supplies and intermediate goods of which you are connected with China. So the more white, the more impact you're going to have from a China slowdown uh, and link to GVC. Indonesia, because main, m most of our exports are coal and palm oil uh, to China, we are less affected. So, you know, uh, what do we do? These ASEAN countries are actually all going through this exercise. Okay, there's this opportunity for export diversification and attracting investment relocation. What do I need to do? Yes, I have to go and do better marketing. Uh, there's also an opportunity to de displace the US in the China market. I just took this figure out because it's Malaysia. Malaysia can replace China, um, U.S. exports to China on waste, scrap, alloy, and natural gas, and benzoyl. That's just an example. Uh, the key is, okay, I know I want to attract uh, investment. I want to be part of the, of the opportunity uh, to take some of the market away from China. What do I need to do? domestic reforms, right? So this is what we're having this big debate, a big discussion in Indonesia. In Indonesia, it's labor policies, trade facilitation, all the usual things, investment climate, and making sure that uh, you, you have, I think the other part of the uncertainty, uh, investors are increasingly wanting to s uh, source locally rather than uh, being uh, sourcing from the local uh, b b global value chain. But all this is fine and good. But we have two elephants fighting. How do we, ASEAN, how do we, each ASEAN country, how do we make sure we don't get squeezed in the middle or get trampled, that it would be even worse, and we really have to avoid taking sides. Yeah, uh, Look at what happened to Australia uh, by uh, apparently taking sides with the US uh, and what China did to Australia, you know? So beware. So we have to be uh, balancing. Uh, and uh, and it is better to be balancing as ASEAN rather than uh, individually. That's another reason why you need to um, uh, uh, have ASEAN centrality. So uh, just to give an example, guess who got a special mention in at the G20 by President Trump? Vietnam. <laughs> Vietnam is now considered one of the worst abusing, I think he used these words, abusing country. And it's no, uh, no rocket science. Uh, in the first quarter of 2019, uh, Vietnam uh, increased its imports into the US by 41%, compared to China going down by 13%. Vietnam is really the one that increased the most. And guess what? In 2017, don't forget there was this executive order in 2017 identifying uh, 15 countries, six, uh, 16 countries that have a deficit with the US and four of them are ASEAN countries. And it is, you know, it, you have a deficit with us, that's unfair trade, we're going to go and investigate why we have a deficit with you and then we're going to do, we're going to make sure that uh, we can correct the deficit. And it's about goods, it doesn't include services and uh, all the, um, the threat is GSP withdrawal or uh, tariffs being imposed on you. Look at what happened to India for instance. So four of the deficit countries are from ASEAN. And just to give you an example of what Indonesia is experiencing, we're having very, very lengthy bilateral talks. Uh, and uh, it is being linked, OK, we're going to let you uh, have your GSP if you do these things. And it is related to the, a lot of it 
it has to do with technology and business competition. It's linked to, okay, you can't uh, have uh, severe uh, requirements on localization of servers. You must have a more open national payment gateway and all these foreign investment restrictions. Uh, please do something about it. Uh, so uh, we, we are doing, uh, as you can see, the way to deal with the U.S. is this voluntary imports. Okay, I'm going to buy more soybeans from you. I'm going to buy Boeing jets from you. Uh, I'm going to buy cotton from you for my textile and garment. Uh, and by the way, we're going to invest in the U.S. Yeah, that that's another part of the strategy. So you have to kind of balance this, uh, uh, so on. So finally. Uh, of course, uh, that's the context, the reality and the context that we are facing. What do we need to do? Okay, this is, uh, those of you who have heard me speak on this before will know this is my, my usual answer. We need a three-pronged approach. Uh, unilateral reforms needs to be continued. Yeah? Otherwise, you know, where are you going to go on the next level of development? How, we have to figure out which part of the global value chain or regional value chain we're going to be part of. And it's about goods and services, as Fuku was uh, emphasizing. But guess what? Unilateral reforms in, uh, in our part of the world, it has always been predicated on regional and multilateral commitments. So it, that's why the next two are very important. You need to have the strengthening and building on regional economic integration, of which ASEAN is central, as well as other fora like APEC. And ASEAN centrality in upholding the multilateral trading system and the rules-based uh, regime. Because otherwise, guess what? It's the G2 who's going to determine the, the next set of rules. China and the US will negotiate between themselves. They'll come up with rules on subsidies, IPR, and so on. Is that, and then we just stand by, we can't do anything about the rules that's gonna be created? No, we can't do that. We need to be uh, making sure that the new rules, uh, we know that these rules have to be uh, created, but they should be uh, created under the multilateral trading system. And that's, I think, Lydia's, one of your principles was, how can ASEAN play a role in making sure we maintain the multilateral uh, rules, the rules-based order. And in the G20, Indonesia submitted a non-paper on WTO reforms. And we got some of the um, other countries to support it. Many countries support it, except one country, as we can uh, imagine. It was a big fight, uh, but uh, WTO reforms and dispute settlement uh, did make it into the leader's statement, uh, for, for better or worse. We'll see whether the political commitment translates uh, into, into the reality that we, we need. Regional. Look, ASEAN's centrality. Regional agreements are still important because they're the only thing that's going on now with, you know, multilateral, of course we have to push, but we know that's complex and difficult, but regional is going on. We are negotiating. We have RCEP, we have CPTPP, but most importantly for ASEAN, uh, we need to have the collective leadership within these regional agreements, whether they are ASEAN deepening, widening ASEAN, or uh, making sure that RCEP, after how many times did we promise we were going to complete negotiations by the end of the year? This year has to be the year we complete negotiations. Uh, and uh, it will, uh, I, I've heard relatively optimistic um, uh, pr scenarios on that. And we have to improve our relations with the rest of the world. We can see Japan is warming up to China. Uh, what about India? We also need to balance with India. Uh, and uh, Regional agreements can also address issues that are not yet addressed in the WTO, whether it's uh, the CPTPP, whether it's RCEP, and even APAC. I think what Fuku was uh, alluding to, many of the issues are, are not just trade issues. It's issues of security, payment, taxation, and so on. These are very, very complex new issues, which you can at least start discussing uh, in, uh, in APAC because you're not negotiating. Uh, APAC has uh, privacy um, rules, and and uh, I wanted to especially uh, focus on APEC because Malaysia is the chair of APEC in 2020. So uh, remember Bogor, remember Bogor goals 1994? Free trade in goods and services uh, and, and investment. Uh, I don't think we mentioned people in, in Bogor. By 2010 for the developed countries and 2020 by the developing countries. Next year is 2020. Malaysia has to come up with a new vision for APEC, for the region, which will also inform ASEAN and uh, the, hopefully other regions. Putrajaya vision for APEC beyond 2020. It is about free, uh, freedom of, uh, uh, it's about openness, yeah, good services, investment, uh, good services, investment, and people, labor, uh, which is 
in all the vision statement, but now there's another one called data. Yeah? Uh, and you have to have these two keywords, shared prosperity and sustainability. <laughs> Yeah, this is, this, this is the new vision uh, that we have to have, which is also the ASEAN vision. Uh, and uh, we need to, to think about, uh, I, uh, let me just focus on APEC and RCEP. RCEP can really create, if we do it uh, in the way we want to do it, uh, is to create the new regional value chain, which will include India. Yeah, India has been one of the, I guess, uh, issues in completing their RCEP negotiations. That's putting it, I think, uh, relatively diplomatically. Uh, and you can imagine an, a new uh, regional value chain with India in it, with services uh, in, included in it, and all the technology issues that uh, Fuku brought up. What will it look like? And what will be the new uh, issues and regulations that will come out of it? And then APAC as the, and Belt and Road Initiative as areas where you can think about the capacity building that's needed, addressing the new issues that we can discuss without having to negotiate, uh, which at, at the end of the day will, will end up in, in a lot of our trade agreements. I'm also an old APEC hand. I, we, I was involved in, this is, sounds really, really strange, non-binding investment principles. <laughs> non-binding. Oh, people always laugh at APEC because non-binding? What does that mean? So non-binding investment principles were passed in 1993 uh, in Seattle. And it sounds really a uh, long time ago, and we were debating about national treatment, about negative list, and guess what? National treatment and negative list after 20 years is, uh, is now in all our uh, investment law and legislation. Just to give you an example of, of the importance of APEC. So Malaysia, we're waiting for you for the Putrajaya vision for APEC beyond 2020. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary, Mary for, for bringing us uh, to the challenges that we are facing today, hmm? now, urgent, big uh, challenges. And in the discussion, we obviously will be uh, looking at how ASEAN is moving uh, or not moving in, in facing those challenges. Uh, at the same time, uh, well, thank you for giving Malaysia this this special role in APEC 2020. We've had discussions about about this, uh, and it'd be a good thing if, <coughs> in Dr. Mahade's uh, uh, chairmanship of APEC uh, next year, his swan song probably, insofar as APEC is concerned, certainly that uh, we do something to establish ASEAN centrality in APEC in APEC. Anyway, uh, I'm not uh, holding you back, I hope, uh, Don. I think Don is, uh, everyone knows, the chief economist uh, at CIMB, he's a trained economist, and he, I believe, will be talking now uh, largely on, on financial uh, integration, financial markets integration, and some of the things uh, Fuku had mentioned with respect, for example, to uh, data flow, hmm, free data flow, uh, they, they do affect, uh, you know, uh, the integration process. So, Don, please. Uh, thank you, Tansri, and uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this. I hopefully uh, you've enjoyed it so far, and I can add to your enjoyment. Partly, what I'm going to do, however, is skip my script because, on the basis of listening to both Fuku and and to Mari. Yeah, I thought it would be better to complement uh, the comments that they had made earlier and get to the discussion rather than run you through the details of, of financial integration because I think there is, uh, it would be more useful for this discussion uh, to avoid that. So let me make a few key points I think that will, that will amplify the elements that have already been uh, highlighted by, uh, by Fuku and Mari. And I want to start first with an apology. As, as an American and an economist, <laughs> in two ways, <laughs> we have let you down. <laughs> the first way, can I take this out? Um, the first way, and I don't need this, uh, is uh, uh, economics as a profession, over, particularly in the 1970s and 80s, uh, when I was being educated and, and starting work, 
very much focused on the power of the market and the benefits associated with trade in making potentially everyone better off. But it's a potential. There are losers. And that focus on using the market came also with a disparagement of government. Unfortunately, to make the environment of trade liberalization, of market opening generally, function for everyone, there needed to be transfers from those who gained to those who lost. And that message never got across in practice because in part of the disparagement of government as a source of, uh, of amelioration, yeah, to the shortcomings of liberalization, which were most evident in finance, Right. As we saw in the Asia financial crisis in 97-98, as we saw in the period of, of problems in Latin America in, at the turn of the century, and that we saw most evidently and most destructively, frankly, in, in the great financial crisis in 2007 and 8. Yeah? And as an American, of course, my apology, and hopefully it won't have to last too long, is for the abdication uh, of, by the Trump administration of a role uh, of commitment to multilateral rules-based uh, act, uh, actions by nations uh, that has been so instrumental to a period of greater, uh, to the diminution of conflict uh, and increase in, in global welfare that we've never seen before. So that is an extraordinarily distressing element. The only ray of hope here is that administrations in the United States are more likely to change uh, than the administration in China is likely to change. And while Mari is absolutely correct that the issues around trade and openness are, don't have the support in the US political body that they did 20 years ago, there is not that same kind of abandonment of rules-based multilateral systems. And some of the issues that, the uncertainties that surround, for example, using terrorists as a punitive tool against Malaysia, against Vietnam, et cetera, that focus on bilateral trade imbalances, that can disappear. Right? Because there are, from a macroeconomic standpoint, the logic of what's being done by the Trump administration is, there is no logic, yeah? I mean, the, the macroeconomic fact is the current account, which is largely the trade balance, is a function of the gap between investment and savings. U.S. macroeconomic policy has been pushing up investment and lowering savings. That means you need other people's money, foreign savings. That means a larger current account deficit. So when you start focusing on bilateral imbalances and say, those Chinese, they are two thirds of our imbalance. That's gotta be unfair. It's like, it's not unfair. You want a slower current account? Uh, sorry, less of an imbalance with the Chinese? Lower US investment, raise US savings. In other words, run contractionary fiscal policy and stop giving away investment credits. But you can't say it that way. That, well, how can you possibly do that, right? But the consequence then is if you try and shrink imbalances with the Chinese, it just shows up in Vietnam or Malaysia because the US is still investing and not saving. <laughs> right? Now, there are other macroeconomists in other, who understand that fact. Yeah? Uh, and as a result, therefore, I think some of the risk, if there is a political change or change of administration, will diminish. Yeah? However, what will not diminish is the those who would argue, had been arguing, that integration of China into the global economy was going to lead to a, not only to economic change, but also to political change. And the uh, actions of the Xi administration of the Chinese Communist Party in his tenure have put paid to that idea. So this is, there is now a competition that isn't simply about the issues of economy, about intellectual property rights, about trade, right? About state subsidies, but a fundamental political competition, yeah? Uh, also, this issue around Huawei and technology is, leave aside the issues of, of the fictitious use of national security around steel or automobiles, yeah? There is a much more fundamental issue around national security associated with, yeah? 
the degree to which communication systems and, and information can be hacked, essentially, or taken by competing powers. So once you have a more rivalrous situation, which we now have, then the question of the connectivity of data and information of communication that Fuku was talking about becomes much more complicated. And in the case of Huawei, it's not an issue from the U.S. perspective fundamentally of whether or not Huawei is an instrument of the Chinese government, but rather is based on the 2017 cybersecurity law that was passed in China, which says, as a Chinese company, you must surrender communications equipment and information to the government on demand. Right? Okay. If, uh, in essence, then, uh, you do not need a back door into the communications uh, information that Huawei has, the Chinese government has a front door. Now, there's back doors in the United States, uh, or front doors in the United States as well, associated with uh, requests that would come from the U.S. administration. Those, at least, have to be intermediated by a judge. In the Chinese context, that kind of balance or check doesn't exist, which means essentially that you are going to have on national security basis a segregation that's unless and until there is some alignment in, in a political sphere, which seems difficult to envision in the current environment, will persist. So we're going to look at a world in which a bamboo curtain, at least as far as technology is concerned, is coming down. What are the consequences of that? I mean, crudely, you can say you got to choose between WhatsApp and WeChat. Which government do you want to share your personal information with? <laughs> but more fundamentally, when you think about that, that's a duplication of systems that increases costs. That even, if Mari says, we need to balance. Yeah, you're going to balance, but on both sides, you're going to have to pay more to balance. That's going to weigh down growth and potential activity for everyone. Yeah? One of the reasons, therefore, that one needs to focus on ASEAN integration is that is a mechanism for actually lowering rather than raising costs. And if we can't do it in the face of this, when in the world are we going to do it? All right? Because even with ASEAN centrality, the political in uh, institutional conflict right, between the ideas that are incorporated in the manner in which China is using its, uh, its newfound strength, which are much more akin to 19th century power politics, which, by the way, mirror what Trump is doing as well, is a world in which you have to unify in order to try and protect yourselves and offset to the degree possible the reductions associated with in growth and potential activity and productivity associated with this fragmentation, with this bamboo curtain. Yeah. Now there is some good news, uh, although it's relatively complicated. It has to do with economics and it has to do with the fact that China's macroeconomic policies these days aren't consistent. Yeah. Uh, in essence, Chinese growth rates, which have been slumping, right, the latest figure was 6.2%, I believe, year on year. The annualized growth rate was roughly comparable. That growth is higher than what the supply side of the Chinese economy can, uh, can engender. Okay? They actually need to be growing at numbers that are somewhere between five and five and a half, sending, lowering in the next five years to numbers that should be in the low fours. That's complicated for China because this, the social contract of the last 30 years has been more limited political choice in the face of greater economic opportunities. But lower real growth is coming with lower nominal growth. People earn nominal incomes. Yeah. Managing that process of deceleration is very complicated. It requires, and it seems at the moment, what is going on is a greater degree of social control associated with the use of social media, right, to control individuals at a level of detail that was impossible the last time we had such kind of regimes, which prevalent, which is the 1930s and 40s, through the well, and into the 50s. Anyway. Um, Potential GDP growth lower than actual growth means a diminution in the either a rise in inflation in China and or a diminution in the current account surplus. 
Already China has eaten away from a turn of pound surplus, which in 90, uh, uh, 2007 was about 10 percentage points of GDP, to a number that's half a percentage point of GDP. So if you persist with this, you are going to move to deficit. China hasn't had to deal with a current account deficit in any year except for 1993. So all this period of huge expansion, of huge investment, was done on the margin with their own money. That's not going to be the case if they persist with trying to maintain high growth over the next few years. That will create leverage for international finance, for investors in London, in Tokyo, in New York, in Singapore. Right? It is part of the reason that China is willing to change its, its foreign investment rules because it would like actually to achieve foreign direct investment as opposed to portfolio inflows. But the, the other issue is if they persist in trying to grow high and the current account does move into deficit, if you don't attract enough additional monies, if you start running down reserves, of which there are three trillion dollars and you're talking about current account deficits, that might be a hundred billion. So three trillion goes a long way in covering those. The issue that then arises is last time China was running down reserves, what happened? Domestic asset holders wanted to get their money out. So what did China do? It put in place effectively tighter capital controls. But what would tighter capital controls mean when you actually have to attract foreign investors in? A less willingness to go in, right? You don't want to put your money in if you can't get it out. So there will be some macroeconomic constraints that will come to place. And if Mahdi had the chart showing businesses concerned about trade protectionism on the one hand versus lower China potential growth, I would flip them. Right? Because you're going to get lower Chinese growth has to happen. Right? It has to happen. Uh, and that chart showing the, the, in the doubling essentially in, in dollar terms of the Chinese economy in the next 20 years is also based on a, a compound annual growth rate that is not going to be nearly as high as those figures imply. And so the challenge then that we're going to, f uh, the, the good news is there are going to be some constraints on economic activity that will force China either to grow within its means and those means will be more constrained by this, this ideological as well as technological and uh, competition or rivalry with the U.S. Uh, but that is an environment in which, therefore, looking to China as the market that will save us, it will still be a very large market and hence lower growth rates still create plenty of opportunity. But it is something that where the cost may not be quite as high and where the benefit, therefore, associated with regional integration can take you further. Yeah. Um, well, I don't, I think I've spoken for, well, I can't get my watch to work. I've spoken for long enough. <laughs> so let me stop here and we'll turn it over to the, the question and answer period. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Don, uh, about American inconsistencies, Chinese inconsistencies. <laughs> uh, uh, now we have a good 45 minutes, okay, for discussion, uh, the panel, and, and, and also for questions or comments, okay, to come uh, from the floor. I think I want to pick out uh, various terms that have come out again and again uh, by the in the report and also by those who made the presentation today i mean you would heard one particular term collective leadership asean collective leadership you would have heard the term asean centrality asean centrality you would also have heard the term integration greater regional integration and of course, you would have heard the term both IR, new technologies, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, there are certain terms that you've not heard, but I can't bring them up. There's, there's something that was not in the report, uh, although there was a, a very good uh, uh, chart I saw in the report in terms of the, the incidence of, of poverty, 
mm, in, in, in ASEAN, uh, $1.60 uh, cents, uh, poverty incidence has come down uh, dramatically, uh, but the, the year that it was used was 2015, actually, it seems to be when the last uh, numbers were, were available. But uh, in that section of the report, uh, this is a term that should not come up, uh, very much is uh, I didn't see enough discussion on income disparity. Uh, poverty is one thing, you know, uh, but income disparity is also very important, and we see the consequences of income disparities uh, in 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 Europe and America, uh, uh, which have resulted in 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 you know sort of political uh, instability and 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 uh, the rise of very strong almost fascist uh, right-wing uh, movements. But never mind, we'll not get into that just yet. Let's, let's start. Uh, let's start with, 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 with collective leadership. And I want to tell members of the panel, the last time uh, ASEAN exercised any kind of effective collective leadership was in 1979, 1980 when ASEAN protected the Khmer Rouge government in Cambodia against Vietnamese invasion in, on, on Christmas Day in 1979, okay. It was very active in exercising collective leadership, particularly at the United Nations, uh, to make sure that the new regime uh, uh, imposed or erected by the Vietnamese was not recognized. Now, if anyone knows of any other instance of strong and effective ASEAN collective leadership since 1979-1980, please tell me. Would anyone in the panel like to pick this up and, and say, oh no, there was something else. Oh no, you know, you, you are being unfair. Murray. <laughs> I was just thinking as you were speaking. I can think of uh, you know the way we we brought Myanmar. I think on the issue of Myanmar, there was collective leadership. You know, we you know in in kind of uh, balancing the human rights issue and the military leadership, and how that should how they should be reforming to become uh, to go to democracy. Right. Uh, I think I think ASEAN was quite united on that. And we fought against the, well, we were collective in our view that sanctions did not help. Yeah, and, and I, I, we, I went, we went through this, whether it was from mainly from Europe at the time. Uh, we even said, if you're not gonna, you know, they, they didn't allow us to come. They did, we had an EU ASEAN meeting in, in, in one of the cities in Europe and they wouldn't give the Myanmar, Myanmar uh, delegates visas. And then we all said, no, we are all not going. If you're not gonna give visas to the uh, our delegation from Myanmar, then no go. And it was also the reason why EU ASEAN never came about because uh, the Europeans said, we want to negotiate with you minus Myanmar. And we said, no, All right? So th that, that's, a, that, that's more on the economic front. Uh, it was economics as well combined with the political issue. And the fact that ASEAN does have, um, you know, does have a view on democracy, but not in the, not in the kind of US uh, pressure way, it more about how do we bring Myanmar uh, I I into a democratic process? Because at least in, in, in the in time I was in government, uh, our president, because we, we went through the same history, right? Going from a military government to a, a democracy. So there were many times when we went there uh, to, you know, to, co to give, ha give advice, consultation, whatever. So that's probably the other only other one that I can think of. And I would say that a lot of the ASEAN the vision for ASEAN, uh, whether you talk about 2003 for ASEAN Economic Community, um, I think I think the vision of ASEAN Community does show uh, collective leadership and you know the the whole notion of ASEAN centrality. Although we always say, okay, now you have it on paper, can you really um, can you really uh, show that you are relevant, that you know you are actually central? Of course, there are examples of non-ASEAN yeah. centrality, like in the South China Seas. <laughs> but no, so but if we, we come to to uh, let's say the economic issues, you know, which is the main uh, the main concern. Yeah, we come to the economic trade issues. I mean, 
uh, in 2009, okay, ASEAN, uh, the ASEAN chair was uh, invited to attend the G20 meeting. This was in London. Yeah. That time, Abhi said, uh, was the prime minister of Thailand, and Thailand was the ASEAN chair to attend it as an observer. I met Abhi said that year in London before he went to the meeting and asked him, what are you going to do or say at this meeting of the G20? He said, oh, no, no, we're just observers, right? We're not saying anything, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, 10 years later, yeah, coming to our present situation, 2019, not only is the ASEAN chair an observer at G20 meeting, we also have uh, the ASEAN Vietnam, because it was the last APEC chair invited to the G20 meeting, right? Uh, and then, uh, you know, we have Singapore, which is very cleverly, yes. you know, inveigled its way in under something called the Global Corporate Governance Group uh, to be at the G20. And then you have, of course, Indonesia, which is a full-fledged member of the G20. When we met the ASEAN leaders uh, in Bangkok, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the summit uh, last month, all right, we said, why has ASEAN not exercised a collective position hmm, about so many issues at G20 level when it's represented by these four people? Do you guys meet to decide to have a common position? And of course, right now is a raging trade war that is taking place. Why are you not doing this? You must do it. We say you must fight for world economic peace. That's the term I used. You must world, what, fight for world economic peace. So again, in terms of collective leadership, to me, ASEAN is failing, it's, has failed. And so this is the, the, the order of the challenge you, you painted, and then the order of the response hmm, in terms of collective leadership, which ASEAN is not exercising. That is a big problem. How do you operationalize these things? We can't wait until 2040, <laughs> you know. Uh, and then this is the problem with ASEAN. How do you operationalize something, you know, would you suggest some ways, I mean, Marie or, or, or Don? Or well, can, can I, because I have the mic in my hand. <laughs> uh, <I> <laughs> it was Indonesia who fought for ASEAN to be an observer in G20. And I think it's the only regional organization which has a permanent seat. So I think that's an important issue. And I think just to your point, as we used to have ASEAN caucus meetings before APEC, before WTO, before any of the, even in the UN. And I think that that's one uh, instrument, uh, one uh, mechanism that I think we have to revitalize and strengthen. I think the other thing uh, that we can focus on is leading by example. So to the extent that one is concerned about issues around commitment to multilateral issues is to reinforce the open multilateral or open multilateralism within the ASEAN context, right? So to the extent to reiterate what Mari was just saying, that we actually make the ASEAN economic community a reality uh, that has the benefit of economic gains within the region, but also is, can be a beacon for what is possible despite the elephants stomping around, yeah? And that that is a, a focus that can be independent but reinforcing to using the G20 voice or other fora that have broader participation. So start at home. Oh. Yeah, I, I just uh, had, had a chance to start and some, some of the meetings related to trade and investment. Uh, so India, South Africa, Brazil, they have big boys actually over there. Uh, but they are not quite constructive sometimes in contents. Uh, but I, I, think, I think can do. I think it's, it's a very big chance uh, for ASEAN to utilize that kind of forum. Uh, G, in G20, uh, I think newly developed and developing countries uh, sh should say something over there. And then I think certainly ASEAN should, should be prepared <laughs> Uh, to do something in a collective manner. And then the, the collective uh, leadership 
uh, does not stop to ASEAN, actually. ASEAN can be a sort of really central figure for a little bit wider uh, range of uh, collective uh, leadership, so including, say, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, sometimes maybe Canada. Uh, I, I think uh, th those countries are somewhere between uh, the US and China, and then the, a sort of uh, uh, political, economic, psychological distance could be different country by country, but uh, we we like to have some good economic relationship between do both actually. So so no, that's a sort of a, a source that uh, we can get together to wa work, particularly for uh, in, in the context of uh, trade, uh, defending on uh, the rule-based trading regime. I think that's uh, the, the, the sort of uh, ASEAN uh, as a sort of a uh, one entity is uh, very, very important, and th th now is a big chance to do that too. Well, before I come to the floor, I want to, to link this up with another commonly used term during the presentations. Uh, this is uh, ASEAN centrality. Hmm? So we were talking about collective uh, uh, leadership just now, and also ASEAN centrality. Now the cynic, hmm? the cynic would say, Oh, so you organize lots of meetings, you know, uh, at least uh, in November every year, you organize these EAS, East Asia Summit, you organize uh, not in, in, in uh, November, but you organize over the ASEAN Regional Forum, right, and you organize a lot of ASEAN Plus uh, summits, and so you say you are central. Now, what is central about what you have done? All that you have done is you have organized these things and people come to you to discuss. But do you have a common position? Are your issues the central issues that are taken back by these guys who come? I mean, the Russians who come, the Americans who come, the Chinese who come to the EAS. They bring their issues and they dominate. ASEAN doesn't have that collective leadership to put across its views effectively. And therefore, what is this centrality, you know, uh, you're talking about? Now we have an issue uh, with respect to the Indo-Pacific, on which ASEAN is struggling, um, struggling uh, to take a common stand. And there is, uh, uh, in Singapore and Indonesia, for example, you know, have rather different views about, about the Indo-Pacific, which is quite common, quite normal. But they have not been able to forge, you know, a, a common position. And therefore, when this is brought by the Americans, as I'm sure they would be in the next uh, November summit you know, on this Indo-Pacific. Now, why can't ASEAN take a, a, a position? You talk about free and open Indo-Pacific. Yeah, that's what Americans are talking about. But you're not talking about free trade, old boy. Hmm? How can you have a free and open Indo-Pacific when you're not even talking about free trade? And ASEAN can really find a common ground, you know, one common bit uh, to respond in respect of the free and open Indo-Pacific that will put the Americans on the back foot, you know. But it's not happening. It's not happening. So there are problems, you know, in ASEAN, getting together, spending time, taking positions, looking seriously at the issues, and say, look, we can find common ground on this. I mean, Marie mentioned the fact that, yeah, you know, on, on South China Sea, you don't have a free and open commerce. Fine, you don't have it. What to do, right? I mean, Cambodia is probably, you know, the, 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 the one. Uh, but uh, when it comes to these issues, you know, of trade, where we have some common ground on open trade, why can't we take it? Now, you take another example. Last year, we signed uh, with China this strategic agreement uh, uh, on vision, uh, vision 2030 with China. China, ASEAN Vision 2030 signed in Singapore. And one of the bit in that, in that statement, in that, in that agreement was that ASEAN and China will try to align, hmm, to align the master plan for ASEAN connectivity with the BRI. Hmm. Has ASEAN worked to try and align this just, off, just as they have signed you know, this statement, given the problems that some countries face in respect of the BRI? There's another area in which you can forge a collective position and be central in the discussions. So ASEAN is not doing its work. The leaders are not doing their work. 
They spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of time, working groups and so on and so forth, uh, you know, ASEAN Free Trade Facilitation Committee, uh, you know, low freight shipment, we spend a lot of time at this really ne details nitty gritty, but nobody is taking leadership, providing leadership, and that, and that is the problem. And you know, I'm sure you agree, you know, and the town, how, how do you make it happen? And Marie has, has suggested that, you know, we, we, we start forming caucuses again, or then use APAC as another caucus to have a vision that ASEAN can commonly, ASEAN very good at vision, as you know, and visions, you know, uh, but doing things is another thing, you know. Uh, but so that's it, you know, on collective leadership and on centrality. Any further comments from the floor to be directed? Yes, please. In the front. Yeah, first of all. Oh, is it all the way. Thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed that uh, discussion. My name is Shanti Shandasani. I'm with ASEAN International Advocacy. A couple of questions uh, to the panel and more specific to Ibu Mari. Uh, Ibu. Um, as you are aware that, uh, you know, I'm also part of CADIN and you attended the CADIN FGD group. Okay, sorry. And, and you attended the FGD group. Just a quick question. Uh, uh, ASEAN, as a 10 nation, have their own country regulations which is, to us, we can't even dictate the countries to have a, a similar uh, harmonized or standard because, you know, they, they have that freedom to do it. I think it is about time, the water level is rising for us to really have a collect, collective law or a standard where we can actually treat trade in such a manner that we protect the region. If you want to, this relates to uh, acting collectively. For example, each individual country in the region is actually uh, adopting to the U.S.-China trade war on their own, uh, you know, positioning their regulations, having the reforms, whereas Indonesia, as you are aware, we are still struggling with, uh, you know, our various reforms that we are working on, the regulations on uh, logistics, on trade, uh, infrastructure that we are trying to uh, address. Is there any way where amidst of all this, you know, first is US-China and then uh, Japan, Korea, and then moving forward, we don't know what war would be there again, you know, which country is gonna come up. That's the first question. Is there, is there, is there any collective formula where the ASEAN as a region can actually address this reforms in a much quicker way because the gap, the disparity of policies and regulation from one country to the other is also still quite big. Uh, that's one. The other one that I'd also like to highlight, I think moving forward where we have, and I think this is uh, to the point that uh, Professor Fukurasang made earlier in terms of digitization where you cannot actually stop this. And you're right. So, um, you know, I'm working with the office of President Jokowi to uh, advise him on how to have human 4.0. And the concept of human 4.0 is how do you actually in how do you how do you integrate humans into the 4.0 era because then they need to be retrained they are you know kind of you know different uh, place with that so uh, you know, we have like. So we have submitted this in the office of uh, President Jokowi, and I think in 2020, he's going to talk about this to the uh, uh, ASEAN leaders. But you know, to your point, this, the level of education uh, of human development and capacity within one ASEAN country to the other also is, is uh, you know, it's a rising issue. I'm looking at this not as an individual country, ASEAN as a 10 countries, I'm looking at this given on the topic we have is collective leadership. Since we are in that mood of talking collective leadership, so I'm just bringing the whole reforms to be at that one reform. Okay. Well, cool. Thank I you. Think you can take the digitization. 
Yeah, I think uh, uh, looking at uh, human resources or human capital or a uh, uh, sort of uh, happiness of uh, people, I, I think that's a really important uh, element that uh, to digest uh, digital technology. So, so I think uh, I have to I have to study that uh, initiative much more carefully, of course. But uh, I, I think it's a very important angle to do that. But so the raising up a sort of reforming uh, education and what deepening of economic integration. Why does it take six years to do it? I can understand that. We have not, you know, unlike TPP, unlike TPP, they had a driver in the US. You know the kind of session, sessional meetings they had, ministerial meetings they had, a leaders meeting in bilateral sessions, all that pushed through. Have we demonstrated that in our set? No. So I think there are areas that we can. It is one thing to say about collective leadership, but whether we have effective leadership is questionable. Centrality, for example, right? Uh, Tantrimuni had talked about Indo-Pacific. Why did it take us so long to respond to that initiative? We know, we know what the objective of it was, but we did not come out. You know, sooner, <laughs> because we could have told them that, you know, we have all the mechanisms, centrality, ASEAN centrality, you have the EAS, you know, the ASEAN Regional Forum, ARP, for example, and all that. But why didn't we respond and say that this is not the way forward in terms of promoting economic cooperation? Of course, it was more security oriented. Economic cooperation is something that we can do it within, you know, Asia Pacific. We have APAC. We have the Indian Ocean Rim, we have BIMSTEC, they're all, you know, all uh, representing economies in that region. We could work together, you know, in terms of enhancing cooperation. We don't have an additional, we don't have to have an additional uh, forum for that. No, there are many, and then finally, Mari, you mentioned about caucus, ASEAN caucus. I was a practitioner. I can quote you instances where, although we have agreed on certain principles or certain decisions within at ASEAN foreign ministers level but when we go abroad for well, I will quote you an example where I was actually involved I won't name I won't mention the country APAC senior officials meeting in Hawaii I don't know whether you're aware Marie you remember we dealt with the issue about APAC membership we wanted three economies to be brought in together it was an ASEAN decision to accept three and not just one, all three as a package. You know what happened in Hawaii when I was there at the senior officials meeting when I was leading Malaysia? The US lady official, Sandra, had informal meetings the night before, called all the economies except Malaysia. Okay? Including other ASEAN economies. Huh? When she convened the plenary the next day, she said, I've consulted every economy, and there is consensus that a decision can be taken to admit one economy into APEC. I said, I cannot agree, because APEC goes by consensus. So I cannot agree with this, you know? And she couldn't agree. And that gentleman from one ASEAN economy, perm sec level, I won't mention the name, all right? I'll tell you privately later. He came to me, Supra, you know, as far as my country is concerned, I'll do what is best for my country. You probably know which, which country that is, la, you know? So that's it. I want just one example. And then in WTO or caucus and all that, you think that's easy to get a common position? What I want to suggest is that within ASEAN, senior officials should deliberate on common issues, adopt principles principles, common principles that we can be adopted by ASEAN as a group and then that be articulated whether in Geneva or New York or anywhere. So I, I must say in all sincerity, I have not seen all that happening. We have caucus for the sake of having caucus, but never to come out with a firm position, a collective position on behalf of the region. Okay, Thank you. I take that as a comment and a story. Okay, a story of what happened in Hawaii. Oh, no, I don't know what happened between you and Sandra, but uh, anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but I think Joki wanted to say something. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, um, I have, my question actually has two parts. The first part is, 
maybe um, since uh, Ibu Mari, you've been you had so experienced in the trade and uh, issues in the region. So, what is your um, honest assessment uh, of ASEAN's political will, collectively and individually, in bringing visions to reality? That's the first part. Is it high, low, lacking? way below expectation and how to incentivize what are the things that we should do it's a how question actually to incentivize the economies to move up to the right level so that visions can eventually becoming a reality just very quickly um, businesses in the region are looking at ASEAN delivering all the commitments that they have signed on there are a lot of trade issues that are moving at glacial uh, uh, pace if stale pace is a bit fast and uh, I think um, at the granular level there are a lot of things that are not moving non tariff barriers is one trade facilitation and etc so I think the right question that would I hope would add value to our discussion is a how question how then should we incentivize the leaders so that there will be an optimal political will to move our visions and make it a reality thank you uh, the first question is assessment of okay. the political will, and then from there, how? Thank you. It's actually related to Supra's comment as well about leadership. Uh, I think we have to also uh, realize the reality is that we are not uh, in the same situation politically in, in each of the ASEAN countries as we were in the good old days uh, when ASEAN was born and, and leaders could uh, speak to each other uh, and there were leaders there who were there for more than 10 years, more than 5 years. Uh, you know, the length of their relationship. Uh, you know, you had Suharto, you had Lee Kuan Yew, you had uh, Tun Razak here and, you know, th th those days were much easier to, to have the collective leadership uh, today is very different. Uh, most, I wouldn't say all, most of the ASEAN leaders are elected democratically. And a lot of them come from uh, regional governments, you know, like my president and uh, Duterte. They were mayors or uh, governors uh, in local provinces, which had little understanding, if you like, uh, of the importance of ASEAN. And it took them, at least in the case of uh, Indonesia, I think it took a little while for, for the real realization of the importance of ASEAN. And it takes a different argument, you know. Uh, so I would say that uh, we've had ups and downs in, in, in the last, I would say since the financial crisis especially, uh, well maybe in the last 10 years, you know, ASEAN leadership has been going up and down uh, because of this uh, changes of leaders uh, and changes in ministers, you know, to Supra's point. The leadership does come from the leaders level, obviously the political will, but the ministers play an important role because they are the ones that have to convince the leader about how important it is. And it, I, I felt that in the time when I was minister, there was a very, uh, it, it, we may disagree, but there was a camaraderie between a collegial uh, atmosphere between the, the trade ministers, uh, not just because we played golf and ate durian together, but... <laughs> But you know, we could call up each other. You know, if the, even if we had a conflict or an issue, and even if we disagreed, we could at least call each other and talk about it, right? So I'm not sure. It's it's a function of uh, maybe because we are in democracies and there's lots of changes in the ministers compared even to the past. I mean, I was probably I was trade minister for seven years, which is pretty unusual for Indonesia, by the way. Since then, I think there's been five trade ministers uh, since uh, I stopped being trade minister. So there is this issue, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's not an institutional or a mechanistic issue. It's just the reality of a democracy. So how do you, how do you then, if the how question, uh, I would say we, the ministers, we, the public businesses, need to do a better job of convincing the leaders that this is important. And maybe, th maybe we should use all the st scary story that I was trying to explain to you uh, in my presentation that we have a crisis. You were also emphasizing Here's a crisis. We are, you know, being pulled in one direction, two directions, and if we don't stick together, you know, uh, we're we're just going to be irrelevant.
irrelevant and, and you know, we're not going to get the benefits and we're going to be uh, suffering because of the uncertainty. You know, if there's no dispute settlement, the U.S. can certainly uh, just keep on pressuring you and you can't fight back. You can't say, oh, this, we, we, we disagree with your tariffs because it's, not, it's ungrounded, it's unfair. We can take you to the WTO, but if there's no WTO dispute settlement, where are we going to go, right? So it's important, for, that's just an example. We have to stick together because there is a crisis. I mean, that, that message needs to be re-emphasized to the leaders so that they will have the political will uh, to, 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 uh, to continue. But then, you know, they, they are answerable to political constituents back home. So, it, okay, so what? Then you have to tell the economic story or the business story. If you don't do this, the investment is not going to come here. It's going to go elsewhere. You're going to lose jobs. Exports, I mean, we're already feeling it. Exports are down, right? The only way you're going to get jobs and exports and businesses to come here is if you collectively use ASEAN, etc. Et it has to be that, that kind of story. And I think it can't, okay, ministers uh, and, and policy makers and think tanks, we have a role, but I think businesses actually have to, to have a louder voice about the importance of openness and how we, we need to survive with the re transformation of the, of the regional value chain. I'll give you a very concrete example in the case of my president because he's a very pragmatic person. The, the, I'll give you two examples. One way he was convinced about the importance of uh, the South China Sea's issue is because he was, um, before he became mayor, he was an exporter of furniture. Okay, so uh, the way it was explained to him, it will pick, they tried many, many weeks to explain to him why it's important for Indonesia to, to take a position and, and try to uh, reduce the conf conflict in the South China Seas. And they were using all the security language. And, and, uh, yeah. and then finally somebody figured out, okay, sir, if you don't deal with this, the export uh, shipping routes are gonna be disrupted. And exports, including furniture, is going to be disrupted. Ah, okay, I got it. Right. So you you also need to know how to how to what makes what what makes it important. Same thing with TPP. You know, we we actually put up our hand in 2015. Yes, we're going to join the TPP, and that was after a lot of uh, lobby from the textile companies and the footwear companies who were set, came to the president and said, "We are going to lose market share to Vietnam if we don't join TPP." And that made a lot of sense to him. Right. So you have to find the right way that makes um, that that you to get to your vision uh, what i'm trying to say is that you need to to be able to explain it in a way which can resonate politically with the leaders and uh, to your point don about uh, you know uh, leaders are all like oh us is going protectionism they want to protect their people we should be doing the same this kind of very bad demonstration effect so how do we convince the leaders that globalization, trade and openness and investment, getting investment is really going to help us uh, and not put barriers, right? The jobs and the equality, the shared prosperity needs to be part of the story. Otherwise, they'll just say, freeze, they say, oh, politically, I can't do that, you know? So we have to be more smart in the way, in, it's a different world. It, it, we have to just be more smart in, in, in the how, yeah? And, and I think, uh, how, how do, can we get leaders to, you know, I, I really miss the days when leaders are really having a retreat and not reading from scripted uh, statements. You know, and ministers similarly. You know, and th th that needs to come back. Otherwise, we can't we can't really talk about what matters and what what we need to do to make the vision a reality. There's also the point, I say, Mark Marie, you're very right. You know, the thing is, you must make whatever you're doing at the regional level and relate it to your domestic level the benefit that will come to your people. So when you talk about shared prosperity, for example, obviously you want it to also benefit your people and therefore you know you can talk about shared prosperity or sustainability. For example, you know, your 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 economy, your 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 ecosystem, your you know, and everything, your environment and what have you. So I think that is what needs to be done. Bring it back to ground, you know? Uh, to the benefits, but okay, we have just a few more minutes left, and I want to uh, get a comment uh, from the floor. I think uh, Dato uh, Tio. Uh, my name is Robert uh, from RSM. Uh, just uh, two points. Uh, 
Uh, point number one, um, it seems to me that ASEAN has a fundamental structural issue to face uh, or to address. Uh, does ASEAN want to be a social club or does it want to be a business club? I think, uh, you know, that is the fundamental issue, I feel, that ASEAN has to address. Because if you want to be a social club, playing golf and et cetera, et cetera, as Marie said, well then it's a one structure. But if you want it to be a strictly serious business club, then the leaders have to sit down and talk business. Business is about very serious issues about how you want to overcome poverty, uh, you know, improve the livelihood of the people, those issues that were, that were sort of illustrated quite well earlier on. You know? So I feel that's the first thing that ASEAN has to address. And I think there are many, many problems there because I believe that the charter in ASEAN says that uh, you cannot interfere in some of the policy decision uh, things in each of the countries. So that has to be addressed. And, uh, you know, talking about a business club, if they want to be a business club, then membership should come in with obligations. It's just like a golf club. If you want to enter a golf club and you want to enjoy the benefits, it comes with a whole array of strict rules and regulations. That's it, issue one. Uh, question number two is, with the headwinds caused by the uncertainty of the uh, China-US trade war, is it an opportune time for ASEAN to say, look here, let the two elephants fight. Now it's a time for us to address our domestic rules, regulations, issues, and improve on intra-ASEAN trade. I believe that's at a very disappointing level. Let us look into the, rea the priority areas now. Let us promote, make, have more business intra-regionally. And I sometimes wonder how many companies from Europe, whenever they come here, many of them would uh, talk to me and say, oh, look here, you know, ASEAN sounds great. It's a market of 600 million. Wow, it's good. We come in here, there's zero tariff. Wow, wow, it's a happy place to set up base. And then we can have a market of 600 million. But bang, bang, when they come here, I wonder how many companies are disappointed when they see the kind of non-tariff issues, the problems, the regulations that are not seamless. A lot, a lot of issues arise, you know. Those are my two points. Thank you. I know I criticize ASEAN a lot, okay. It actually has got rules and regulations. It even has, even has law. You know, there's something called the ATIGA. Hmm? Mari, you were involved in this, Mari. ASEAN Trade in Goods Agreement. It's an agreement, hmm? but it's not enforced. Hmm? ATIGA is not enforced. There's non-tariff barriers, non-tariff measures are in contradiction to many of the ATIGA provisions. Okay? But it is not the ASEAN way to enforce things in law hmm? against anybody. They try to cajole and and, 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 but there comes a point huh, when you have to get a bit serious, you know. And so, you know, the way the non-tariff barriers and measures have increased so much. In 2015, I remember there were about 5,900. Today, there are about 9,500 non-tariff barriers, non-tariff measures. So somebody's playing silly buggers here, you know, in, 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 but then, you know, nobody's pulling them up. On the other hand, on the other hand, tariffs are virtually zero. This is a progress that has been made, which is not often realized. Tariffs are virtually zero. And that took quite a long time. And also to get the, the CV, uh, CVLM countries to bring down their tariffs. And that's a great achievement. The tariffs are lower than the tariffs that China has in its market. And uh, only the U.S. has got lower tariffs, I mean, except those against China now, you know. So ASEAN has made some kind of progress somewhere which we must uh, recognize, you know. But then it's got issues now about greater integration, closer integration, which is not happening. Yet, it also has got mechanisms to try and facilitate trade. Hmm? I mean, the ASEAN single window, 
The national single windows are mechanisms to facilitate trade, and they do exist. And countries are coming on and starting their single windows, you know, that they're doing. So there, are, there is progress. The thing is, my view is, it's suboptimal. It could be optimal. That's a big problem. When you talk economics and business, you want to optimize, you know, your, your, your investment, get the returns. And that's a problem. And so, well, suboptimal, actually, sometimes is better than the rate of growth in Europe. Hmm? And it doesn't matter. People still come, despite you know, despite these kinds of things. And you know, when it's going, it's already overtaken UK in terms of size of economy. In 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 in, in uh, uh, it's number number UK was number five, I think. Yeah. Now ASEAN is actually number five. You know, not in PPP terms alone. You know, we are talking about actual you know nominal terms. And so you know, it is growing. If it was one economy. But guys will come and say, well, it's just becoming one economy. But I have all these frustrations, <laughs> you know. But never mind. At least it's growing. It's growing, you know. And so that's what's happening. The dynamics is people are unhappy, but they are attracted, <laughs> nonetheless. But ASEAN cannot be so complacent. People are attracted, so we can, all right, we can work suboptimally, you know. So there is this, this, this tug and pull, you know. Uh, you know, the dynamics is quite, quite, quite interesting. And, and you know, we, we do it, uh, do, do a lot of work at, at working group levels and we see how the customs react to a simple thing about low shipment, low value shipments should not be touched. Let them happen. Don't have put any rules and regulations. And they say, ha, huh? why should we do this? So it happens in Europe, for example. Okay, go and study. Uh, do, do a study in Europe. And then we find out there's no cost to any country allowing you know, low value shipments to move. And then they say, ah, but uh, mm, customs you know, needs to have a say, you know, there are all sorts of things that come in, including corruption, okay, that come in. So, so you know, it is a dynamic process, it is a, sometimes a circular process that's taking place, uh, but there is progress here and progress there, but generally it could be, could do better. <laughs> Essentially, could do better. And one of the things that uh, Fuku, uh, you've been saying, you know, it might do better with technology already. Because certain things you cannot stop from crossing borders, whatever you do, telemedicine, for example, you cannot do anything against it. So it's going to happen, right? So, Fuku, you want to f say something finally, members of the panel, on any point? Just a. Uh um, uh, non-tariff measures, or I would say non-tariff barriers. I think uh, so, so we have some uh, really pre pretty nasty cases, definitely. So we really have to pinpoint, uh, say, automobiles, for example. <laughs> and that, that's a big one. But uh, uh, so the number of NTMs uh, is a bit uh, misleading, I think. Uh, actually, the area, uh, our institute is uh, really counting the number of uh, NTMs. Uh, many are relatively innocuous actually. Uh, so the very large portion is uh, S SPS, uh, quarantine, and also TVT, uh, t t technical barriers to trade. Uh, many ASEAN countries are actually um, actually building up a sort of a, a safety regulations and others in the process. So that, that blows up the number of NTMs, actually. So not all are bad. Uh, so we really have to see in detail that the, some bad ones are there, obviously. So we have to check that. But the number itself is a bit uh, misleading. So it's just a footnote. Mark, Mary, please. Yeah, I'll go back to my three-prong uh, approach because I think to answer your question, that is exactly what we need to do. We have to start with the unilateral reforms, uh, but it can't. It's not in the absence of what's happening regionally and multilaterally. So we do need to do it on all three fronts. Uh, and unilaterally, we need to figure out the reforms that we do are important because uh, of our own development agenda and our own structural uh, change agenda. 
uh, for the growth, you know, finding source, new sources of growth and so on. But it needs to be, you know, when you are reforming, it's always important that it's based on international best practices in whatever you're trying to, to change or reform, including standards, right? And including uh, what's happening multilaterally. So you can't ignore these two elephants totally uh, because they are disrupting the, the WTO and the dispute settlement system. So you'd want to have to be able to, to uh, and, and I think the, the WTO and the dispute settlement system and the rules-based order is important to make sure that your domestic reforms are going to be in line, right? I'll give you a very concrete example of a non-tariff measure. Yes, a lot of them are in, uh, in line with precautionary standards. This is Pascal Lamy's language. We're going from uh, cross-border protection to behind-the-border precautionary uh, standards, but they can be uh, used as protection uh, measures, and Indonesia had a few of those, and we got taken to the WTO dispute settlement and we lost, okay, and we have to change it, right? So there's this the disciplining aspect of it is still very important and that's why the rules-based order needs to be there as you are doing your reforms. And regional is important exactly for the reasons all of you have been saying. Uh, as we are facing this uncertain world, let's at least make sure we're, we have a certain world uh, between our neighbors, between uh, you know the larger market that we continue the openness. And the openness is not just about tariffs, but the non-tariff measures, the trade facilitation, the people movement. I, I'm I think with the demographic uh, changes that's happening in ASEAN, people movement and talent movement with the digital uh, world, that is going to have to be part of your uh, ASEAN agenda if you're going to attract uh, those who want to locate here. Uh, I don't know about the, the, the localization. Indonesia is not the only one that has server localization regulations, but for your information, we are trying to come up with a more sensible policy, which uh, you don't have to put everything in Indonesia, but there will be categories of data, you know, uh, highly, highly strategic and secure, secure and then low, low security, something like that. So, you you know, uh, we, we know, we know uh, the issues. So, uh, so I think at the end of the day, we have to be able to move in, in our own countries, but do it in a way which at the end of the day, the day will have regional as well as global um, uh, opening up uh, possibilities, the pathway forward. Gosh, the other panelists have, I think, covered the most important things. The only thing as an economist I would argue is that it's not just a question of the messaging, but it's a question of quantifying what the benefits and the costs are. Because part of what has changed is that the costs of not integrating have gone up as a result of this conflict between the Chinese and the Americans. And that, in order to therefore reinvigorate the process of integration, is to, is to say, hey, the benefits of doing this are now going to be much higher because of the cost that the external environment is now imposing on us. And then taking that and turning that into a messaging that resonates with the local political environment and, and the constraints and issues that are, we are grappling with. And part of that, by the way, I think is uh, the deceleration in nominal growth that pretty much every country is facing. And lower nominal growth makes politics more difficult because it makes the opportunities for win-win situations. Uh, fewer. And to the extent, therefore, that you can boost that nominal growth, and uh, hopefully not through inflation, but through real activity, which is the promise of the integration, that's a story that can be very, very powerful. And that can address in the yeah. Malaysian context this issue of cost of living. It's not so much cost of living, it's the income that you have to face the costs. Yeah? And when that's not growing in double digits, but only growing at three or four percent, Wow, the world looks a lot more severe. But when we can, can, if we can boost that nominal growth, we have an opportunity and get that message across, then we have an opportunity to, to make a better world, a more socially inclusive world, a more sustainable world. And that's a voice that needs to come from, from all of us in realizing our interconnectedness, which is ever more uh, the, a fact of our lives. Well, thank you very much. I'm not uh, actually ASEAN is a work in progress, right? It's a work in progress, but it's also WIP. 
It's also got to be whipped, W-H-I-P-P-E-D, into shape, better shape, and better action. And we must all be involved in that process. I think uh, we've had a very wide-ranging discussion today, and uh, I think uh, the panel speakers have been most engaging, as, as, as well as, uh, you know, have taught us quite a number of things. And I would like you, finally, as before we leave, uh, to show your appreciation to members of the panel, as well as uh, Lydia, who made the first presentation. And I'd like to thank you for your presence, uh, indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.